We have a presentation today using dialogues and role play to build conversation confidence. And I think this is a, such an important topic uh, because really English language learners, when they come in uh, to uh, uh, literacy or English language program, that's really one of their primary goals is to be able to uh, talk, talk in a natural way, interact with folks in their community. And so the better we can get as instructors in building those, um, not just conversational skills, but building that confidence level uh, that students feel confident in kind of going out and engaging with native English speakers, uh, the better off everybody's going to be. So again, a little bit about the uh, uh, kind of mechanics of today. We're gonna ask that you use the chat to introduce yourselves, what you're doing. Uh, to share links and resources with the group. Danielle, as we're going through, is going to be popping a bunch of links and resources into the chat that Stephen's mentioning. And that's a good place to ask questions of other people in the group. We are going to ask that you use the Q&A to ask questions of Stephen. And that just helps us track all the questions, make sure everybody's questions get answered. And Stephen, as always, uh, we'll stick around and pass the top of the hour uh, to make sure everybody's questions get answered and get on the recording that we send out. Speaking of which, we are recording. We always get that question. We're all, we are recording. Uh, in about a week, uh, you're going to get a follow-up email with links to the webinar recording. You're going to get a, a copy of the slide deck a webinar summary sheet that Stephen's put together with kind of the key points of what he talks about today, transcripts of the chat and the Q&A, and if you're attending today, you will also get a certificate. On the right-hand side, you'll see links to Stephen's coaching sessions. Those of you that have participated in the coaching sessions, you'll know that they are extremely valuable. If you haven't participated in them, uh, what they are is, a uh, couple of weeks after the webinar, Stephen has scheduled some small group coaching sessions. You can go in and sign up for one that matches your schedule there in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, up to 10 participants. Um, and it's just an opportunity to kind of ask Stephen specific questions about what he's talking about today and connect, uh, be able for you to ask questions about your particular situation. Here are the students that I'm working with. Here's a particular concern they have. Stephen, what would you recommend that I do? And he'll tell you, and probably the other people participating in the uh, coaching sessions will have some excellent ideas as well. So it's just a great way to kind of network and get really targeted uh, support. And with that, my job is done. And I'm going to turn things over to Stephen. So I will stop sharing. And Stephen, it's all yours. OK, well, it's great to see everybody back. Um, I, I'm looking through that list of names. I'm like, OK, I recognize a lot of names on there from, uh, from previous webinars and from coaching sessions. Uh, I saw somebody mention how much they enjoy the coaching sessions. and. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, I really enjoy the coaching sessions, too. I, I very much look forward to those every time. Uh, those are just a great opportunity for us to um, to kind of dig in and uh, get into the weeds a little bit of, of you know, the specifics of what we're talking about today. Uh, so I uh, hope that um, a lot of you get to join us for some of those as well. Um, so what we're going to be looking at today, uh, using dialogues and role play uh, to, uh, to help get your students talking a bit more in class. Uh, so what we're going to start off with, we're going to spend some time talking about how to choose the right method, what's going to work best for, uh, for you and your class. And then we're going to uh, look at the specifics of dialogues and role plays and versus simulations. Uh, so we're going to spend a little time talking on each of those. Uh, so, getting started, uh, let's talk about uh, how do we choose that right method. Uh, as with most things, whenever you're picking them for your class, the first thing you need to look at are your learning objectives. Uh, what is it that I want uh, my students to be able to do by the end of this lesson? 
The other thing to keep in mind is the makeup of your class. Some of your students are going to love doing dialogues. Some are going to want the freedom of a role play. Some are going to be terrified by role plays and don't want to do those. They only want to do dialogues. So really be thinking about uh, what it is that your students are going to be, uh, what skills they're wanting to develop, and uh, what are they comfortable doing? And then kind of building on that to get them uh, more comfortable just speaking in general. Uh, so going to start off with dialogues. Dialogues are definitely the most structured of the three types that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, all of the words are planned in advance. Everything is on the paper. They don't have to uh, really be uh, thinking about too much whenever they're speaking. Everything is right in front of them. So it really lowers that stress level for the student. So they're going to be a lot more comfortable working uh, on a dialogue because everything is there in front of them. Uh, and, and a lot of times whenever you're getting people just getting them to talk, uh, that lowering that stress level is going to be very, very important. Uh, the benefits of the dialogue is they work at every level. Uh, some of the other methods are going to work a lot better whenever you're working with uh, intermediate or higher level students. Uh, but di dialogues, those can work with uh, with even basic level students. Uh, it just uh, it allows everyone to get to participate. Uh, this is a great way to work on very specific vocabulary and specific word order and sentence structure. So if during your class you've been uh, looking at some specific vocabulary and you want them to continue practicing that, having them use it in a dialogue will reinforce uh, its pronunciation uh, and how it is used in a sentence. If what you've been working on lately is uh, making sure that uh, students have uh, proper word order, uh, that their sentence structure is, uh, is more solid, by having the, uh, the entire dialogue written out, they're hearing it exactly um, the way it is supposed to be uh, because that's how it's written on the paper. So it gives them that opportunity to practice that specific word order and uh, that uh, specific sentence structure. Uh, so this is what uh, I call version one of the dialogues. In this case, it is uh, completely created by the teacher or the tutor uh, or the textbook. Uh, a lot of times textbooks will have a, uh, the dialogue, uh, dialogues built into their lessons. So it gives them uh, the chance to use whatever's been, uh, they've been practicing during uh, that unit. And so this one uh, was pulled out of uh, the Venture series from Cambridge University Press. And uh, these two dialogues are um, you know, practicing working uh, on telephone skills, which, as we all know, working on telephone skills is really important because the telephone's pretty hard to do whenever you're working in a new language. So this gives um, that opportunity to practice that in, uh, in a controlled environment. So uh, the, this is two examples of uh, how to practice on the phone. Uh, a variation on version one uh, that sometimes I will do is I will split the two dialogues onto separate cards. The, uh, each student will only get their own part of the dialogue, so they will only know what words that they're, they're going to be saying. The reason I do this is it makes the student listen a little more carefully. They're not just waiting until the other person gets through their lines and then they speak uh, and they're just immediately jumping to their own part. In this case, they have to listen to what is it that my partner has said and then I respond. And so you can use this as a bit of a listening activity in addition to a speaking activity. Um, version two is, um, is where a teacher will create the, uh, the dialogue, but will leave blanks or they'll just use sentence starters. And so then the students get to fill in the blanks using their own answers. They will get to spend some time uh, working in pairs or trios, uh, looking at the dialogue, 
thinking about how they want to fill in those blanks and so that uh, each group that gets to participate uh, will have um, their own responses that they get to fill in. This gives the student a little more autonomy in that they can fill in the blanks the way they want, uh, but it also uh, is in that low stress environment of everything's written out before they uh, present in front of the class, in front of every, until before everyone gets to, to see what they're, uh, what they have to say. Uh, so this is a great uh, opportunity uh, for them to, to get the freedom to add their own words in, but still uh, have that security blanket of the paper in front of them. A variation on this is uh, where you work as a class filling out an info grid. And so kind of like the Mad Libs that we, uh, we played when we were younger, uh, everybody uh, will uh, call out like a name of food, a type of a restaurant, uh, or a period of time. And so as these things, uh, as people in the group are, are uh, yelling out, they get to, uh, uh, they get their responses written on the board and then they can use these um, answers because all of these are gonna be uh, available for everybody to get to see. Then when they get their, their dialogue, uh, the, uh, the answers, answers are already on the board, they can pick and choose which ones uh, they want. Um, makes it a little bit easier if you've got a, a class that is uh, that struggles a bit with uh, providing, you know, coming up with their answers uh, or they, they feel a little shy, it gives uh, everybody an opportunity uh, in, a, in a less stressful situation where they can, um, uh, they can still participate uh, but they don't have the, the pressure of filling it in on their own if they don't uh, feel comfortable doing that. Um, version three is a completely student created. Uh, in this case, what I usually do is I will put the students into pairs or trios, and then I will give them a theme that they can work on or a vocabulary list or a combination of the two and then the students will write their dialogue themselves, uh, either using that theme or the, uh, the vocabulary words that I've chosen. And then I tell uh, the groups that each person in the group must speak at least twice. And so uh, you get the exchange of at least, uh, at least uh, each person speaking a, a couple of times. And then they can kind of go from there if they want to, uh, but they have that minimum of at least twice. And um, you can make the themes, uh, again, based on whatever you've been working on in your class. Um, I, I try to make them uh, things that the student is likely to be doing in their daily lives anyway, uh, but you can uh, build it off of whatever, you, um, whatever you've been working on. So in this case, the vocabulary list I pulled from unit two uh, of Ventures level four, and you can see that this vocabulary list is, uh, is quite advanced. And so that gives you the, um, the opportunity to, uh, to really uh, build on the vocabulary that they've been working on. And so because some of these words are a little tough, uh, they are probably gonna uh, want several opportunities to practice them. And this is uh, another uh, chance you can get. Uh, so whenever you're writing your, voca uh, your dialogues, there are some things that I think you should keep in mind. Um, first off, use natural language. Use the language that they normally hear, that they are going to hear in uh, everyday life. Uh, you don't want to get uh, um, too extravagant in the language or too formal if that's not uh, what you've been working on. Uh, choose language that they're going to be comfortable with, that they're going to hear. Um, also, match the length of, uh, of the dialogue to the skill level. When I have the students write their own, um, I tend to go a little lower. Uh, so I would have the students write um, maybe two or three exchanges. If I'm going to write them with a lower level student, I would have them do three or four exchanges. With a higher level student, 
Um, I would ask them to do three or four if they were writing it. If I'm writing it, I'm going to have them do five or six. Um, so I'm going to give them a little bit extra if I'm going to write them, uh, but I'm going to give them a little bit of a little bit less if I'm having them writing. But what I have found in the classes that I, where I've done this, um, particularly in my higher level students, I'll say that you need to have four exchanges and then many of them will come up with six, eight, 10, ten exchanges. Um, they often will, will get very uh, creative on, on how they uh, create their own dialogues. A lot of the students uh, will go way above and beyond uh, whenever they're creating their own. They'll end up making them much harder for themselves than I would have made them for them. Um, uh, but again, what I, I always recommend, uh, you focus on common language. Uh, think about the vocabulary that your students have been seeing in their textbooks recently. Uh, what's the new vocabulary for that unit? Uh, and then also, what kind of vocabulary have your students been asking you about? Uh, I know that my students always bring me words of like, okay, I don't know what this word means. I, uh, I heard this at, uh, at work or I heard this on TV. Uh, can you help me with this vocabulary? And uh, incorporate that into, uh, into your lessons and uh, into um, dialogues if it's appropriate for what you've been working on. Uh, it's a good opportunity for them to see, oh wait, my, student, my teacher is really listening to uh, the things I ask about, and they're, uh, in, they're building their lessons around uh, what I'm needing. And it really uh, helps your student feel more connected to the class uh, because you are including what they're working on. Um, also, keep sentences short. Um, I, I sometimes see people will write um, like paragraphs into their, uh, into their dialogues, and I'm like, that's not how we talk. Um, you know, right now, of course, I'm talking in paragraphs, uh, but <clears throat> excuse me, uh, whenever we are talking with each other, that's not how it goes. <clears throat> um, most of the time we talk in short, uh, simple sentences. Uh, we of often talk in fragments and that's okay too in a dialogue. So uh, keep that in mind uh, that it's okay to write sentence fragments when you're looking at dialogues. Uh, they in general, don't uh, put more than two sentences in an exchange. Uh, keep them short. Um, also, make sure that the scenarios are relevant. Um, thinking about, you know, what would your, uh, what would a student say to their boss? What would they say to um, their child's teacher? Um, put these things into practice so that they have the opportunity um, to practice meaningful uh, scenarios. That's going to uh, be the things that stick with your students the best uh, whenever it's important to their lives. And so uh, always keeping uh, your lessons as relevant as possible uh, is something that uh, I always try to keep in mind. Uh, when I'm creating lessons and when I'm working with my tutors and I'm telling them, make sure that you are uh, keeping uh, everything that you're doing in, uh, in your lessons uh, relevant to the student. You know, you know, always keep in mind that the things that you're learning in, their, in your lesson today, they should be able to use that tomorrow at work. Uh, so that's something that uh, is just as important in writing your dialogues as it is any of your other lesson building. Uh, another thing, um, yeah, uh, kind of building on that, always keep it useful. Um, choose the things that are real world, not just classroom based. Uh, I guess I cannot uh, emphasize that enough uh, because I really want you to always keep that in mind. Uh, yeah, there's certain things that, uh, you know, we learned in uh, when I was learning. Um, uh, German in high school and you know I could I learned how to say um, this is my big red pencil and I've been to German speaking countries many times and you know how many times I've had to use the sentence this is my big red pencil um, never um, just hasn't come up and so keep that in mind as you are uh, building your dialogues make sure that you, whatever you're doing uh, it's something they're actually going to be able to use in the real world uh, not just in the classroom um, the next type of 
uh, of dialogue that I want to talk about are simulations and role plays. And uh, some people may say I'm kind of splitting hairs here uh, between simulations and role plays, but I do see a significant difference. Uh, in a simulation, the student will play themselves. Uh, the student is going to be them in a real world situation that that student is facing. Uh, and so um, it is something that is appropriate to them in their lives at that moment. Uh, a role play, on the other hand, is when a student is playing a, anybody. They could be, uh, they, it could be themselves, it could be just a, a character that they've created out of their mind. Um, and so um, in the role play side, um, while it may be um, an authentic scenario, it doesn't have to be, it could be a less authentic scenario. Uh, but in the, uh, the simulation, it is something that where the student is playing themselves uh, and it is an authentic uh, scenario for them. Um, I, the benefits of these are, uh, it really does uh, help develop a lot of skills. These are great for uh, higher level skill building in particular because they are very spontaneous and um, and so it's really is kind of developing um, that ability to speak in, um, in, a, in a real world situation. Um, it also helps them develop confidence in unfamiliar situations because they've had that opportunity to, uh, to get to practice these um, in class when they are in a situation outside of class uh, where they can't necessarily predict what the other person is going to say, uh, they're going to be a little more comfortable because they've had that practice uh, in your class. Um, so with a role play, in this case, um, what, uh, the first uh, type of scenario I want to look at uh, is called a discourse chain. Uh, what, what you do as the teacher is you're going to help, uh, you either going to map out the conversation or you're going to help the students map out their conversation. Uh, and then each person, each of the speakers is given a responsibility in that conversation. Um, the student creates exactly what they're going to say, but the conversation is kind of mapped out of, the, of one person speaks, uh, about this, the second person speaks on this. Um, so here's an example of that, uh, where you see uh, that the the, uh, the first person is going to answer the phone uh, from a, uh, from a, as being an employee of a hospital, and then the next person is trying to make an appointment um, for uh, for. A hospital visit, and each step of the way, it goes back and forth. Of this is what um, person A is doing, this is what person B is doing, uh, and it uh, it backtracks uh, back. It goes back and forth, so each person gets the opportunity to uh, to say what it is they're supposed to say. But as you can see, um, it the um, the person who is made the phone call uh, is just given ask the time of appointments, um, uh, agrees to take that time, gives their name and phone number, says goodbye. So it doesn't exactly tell them word for word what they're supposed to say. What it does is it gives them uh, their, their part of the conversation and they have to fill in the blanks themselves. So it's that opportunity for them to kind of um, build on uh, the things you've been working on but they have to create the, uh, the conversation spontaneously. So uh, it's a little bit higher level skill than what we were working on with, uh, with dialogues where everything's mapped out in advance. Uh, in this case, they can see what the other person is doing uh, and what their part is, but nobody is given all the words they need. Uh, they have to create them on their own. Uh, another variation on this is uh, what I call cue cards. Uh, in this case, there's even more freedom. Uh, each person is given a card with instructions about what their character wants. And that's all they get. They don't know what the other person uh, wants. They don't know, uh, they don't, they're not given any vocabulary or word choices. 
Uh, they're not giving, given any sentences. Uh, they are just given uh, information about uh, what it is their character wants. So uh, here's an example of that. Um, student A has just moved to a new neighborhood. Uh, they uh, see their neighbor and ask for uh, directions to places around the neighborhood, like the bank or the grocery store. Um, person B uh, is given the information of where the grocery store is, uh, where the post office is, where the school is, where the bank is. Uh, but they don't, uh, but they, again, they don't necessarily have uh, all the information provided to them. They have to create a lot of the conversation themselves. And so they, uh, as a pair, uh, will get to act out this scenario, uh, but only seeing what's on their own card, they don't know what the other person has. Uh, a fun team activity that you can do with this is uh, where you, again, have uh, um, objectives for each side. Uh, you can divide your students up into teams of like three to five, and each team is given an objective. And a student from each team will start the conversation and they will continue to talk until one of the student, one of the speakers gets stuck. If they feel like they're stuck, they can tap out. And then the next teammate st steps in and continues the conversation. And the conversation will just keep continuing uh, until everybody has gotten the opportunity to speak. Uh, and then you can run this a couple of times with different scenarios uh, or having them swap sides on the scenario. Uh, and so they have that opportunity to, uh, to get to practice. But again, if they feel like they get stuck, they have the person behind them who will step in and, and continue the conversation for them. Uh, and uh, it takes some of the, the pressure off of it. And a lot of times games like this can be a lot of fun in your class. Um, so then looking at simulations, um, again, with simulations, what we're really going to be thinking about is authentic topics. What is your student currently facing? What are they dealing with right now in, uh, in their lives? Uh, and it's going to be things like making doctor's appointments, talking to their boss, uh, going for a job interview, um, and, uh, and just other things that can happen in in the, uh, their lives. Uh, what I'd like for you to do right now is um, uh, in the chat or uh, put in some real world scenarios that your students may face outside of the classroom or the workplace. And you'll notice that uh, the, uh, a lot of the, um, the ones I give do tend to be workplace uh, situations. And because, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of you are dealing with uh, WIOAs uh, and the requirements of that, so you understand how important workplace scenarios are. Uh, but thinking about um, your students outside of the workplace, uh, what kind of scenarios could you put um, uh, put your students in, or what would your student be in on their own, and they could come to you asking about. Uh, so, you know, I'm noticing that the chat's jumping up right now. So I'm hoping a lot of people are adding things into that. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to be honest, I'm going to steal some of these too uh, and use them uh, with, uh, with my volunteers as well so that uh, they can use these uh, in their lessons. So, um, so, so this slide actually is a little bit self-serving because uh, I always like to hear what uh, other people are, are doing in their groups as well. Um, so with scenarios, you know, like I said earlier, uh, the student will play himself or herself and the teacher or the tutor will be playing the other participant. Um, and um, this uses a lot of the same techniques that you have in role play, uh, but it is a little bit different uh, because the student is playing themselves. Uh, the, the nice thing about this is it does simulate that uh, unpredictability of a real world conversation. Uh, and you can help your student focus that vocabulary around uh, what the conversation is. Uh, for example, if your student is going to their boss because they need to ask for some vacation time, um, you know, helping them find the vocabulary they need uh, when asking for time off, or if they're going to ask for a raise, um, what kind of uh, vocabulary would they need around that? Um, you'll notice that I keep saying that in this one, um, the, um, 
the tutor or the teacher is the other person. And the reason I tend to do that is because um, the, the other person in their scenario is likely to be a native English speaker, uh, just like uh, the teacher or the tutor is likely to be. And so that kind of can help them in that uh, environment where they, um, um, where they will be uh, talking to a native speaker and so they can get, get that practice in a little bit more. It also uh, allows the student to dive into a scenario that the, they may not feel sh comfortable sharing uh, with the entire class, but they are comfortable uh, sharing it with the teacher. Um, and so this does tend to be something that I find these are really, really great in one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring situations. Um, sometimes they work in a full class, but maybe, uh, maybe not all classes. That isn't to say that another student can't play the other person. Um, I'm just saying it's in most situations, it's not the way um, I normally do simulations uh, because I find that the simulations tend to be uh, a lot more personal in nature and not all of our students feel really comfortable uh, in that situation, uh, being able to share everything uh, with the entire class. Okay, I'm hoping that that has brought up um, a lot of ideas for you and uh, and what you are going to be doing in uh, with your classes and how and I'm hoping that these are something that you can use in uh, in your classrooms. Um, but I am going to stop my share right now and I want to spend a little time uh, answering your questions. Um, and Great. seeing what kind of things have come up in uh, in the the chat with uh, your ideas for uh, real world scenarios. Yeah, we have uh, three, I think, really good questions. So okay. the first one is from uh, Dara or Dara. Um, how can these techniques be adapted to online Zoom classes? And I'm I'm kind of kind of seeing. Uh, uh, two issues and there and there may be more but you know some of the models where you had people um kind of getting things ahead of time and working in teams like that's tough you have to kind of plan out how you're going to send things out and then just being able to support people so can you kind of walk us through how you would adapt or utilize some of these these strategies in an online zoom kind of class um, okay, the first thing that jumps out to me is breakout rooms. Um, you would uh, divide your teams, um, put, putting the people who are paired together in breakout rooms and giving them the opportunity to practice. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'm sorry about the coughing. I have been dealing with some severe allergies right now. And so uh, my voice is not as great as uh, as it normally is during these. Uh, but yeah, I would, I would break out the students and uh, put them up into breakout rooms, give them some opportunities to practice together that way. Um, and then they can use uh, the chat to, uh, to write the dialogue together uh, and then um, and using that uh, method. But also they could, uh, while in their breakout room, they could jump into like a Google Doc and they could uh, share their uh, their writing together, and so they could um, uh, each have that Google Doc open where uh, both of them are able to edit at the same time, and they could be in there editing together um, while they're in their breakout room, and they can discuss what uh, they uh, want to add or how they want to create it themselves. And so uh, that's probably what I would do. Um, and as far as, and then as the teacher, I would be bouncing around uh, the breakout sessions and uh, breakout rooms and let it, and then kind of answering questions as they, they go that way. Um, similar to the way I would uh, pair them up at, at a table and work my way around the room. Yeah, I think the use of uh, Google Docs as, a, as an assisted tool for that uh, sounds really good. When I was thinking about it, I was thinking about Jamboards as another way where you can yeah. create a Jamboard for all the students who are student A 
and a separate Jamboard for all the students that are student B. And so you can share their particular Jamboards with them, breaking out B's together in a breakout right. room and A's together in a breakout room. They look at their Jamboards, they talk about it, and then you come back and you repair them up and they have access to like their jam board and not a not the other side of the conversation some things like that but i think there's right. a lot of good good tools you make a you make yeah. a great point right i like that idea of having all of the the a side of the conversation get to uh, to shock, to talk and share ideas and then all the b sides uh get to talk and share ideas uh they know what's going on on their side of the conversation um but they don't necessarily know what's going on on the other side uh, until they're in the middle of it. That would uh, definitely uh, help a lot of people because uh, the people who are a little nervous uh, would get to be able to see uh, what other people on the A side are going uh, to do as they are uh, preparing for, for their turn to speak. Yeah, yeah. Um, another good question, and this, again, is kind of one of those things that comes up a lot when we're working with English language learners. So in the context of working through a dialogue or uh, creating a dialogue or getting the students comfortable with the dialogue, how do you deal with uh, translations, uh, especially of hard words to uh, translating those difficult words to the student's native language? Do you find that useful or not? Okay, so I have um, some rules on translations that I have instituted um, many, many years ago with uh, basic level one and some level two students, translations are fine. Um, you know, jumping, you know, jumping back and forth between uh, using a translation and uh, and other methods of getting the point across pictures or definitions or whatever uh, that's fine with lower level students um, in the kind of the higher end of level two um, and then through level three we're in that transition phase above that um, i do not allow translators um, levels um, like four five six translation translators are not allowed uh, English only dictionaries are, uh, are, are what I am wanting. Um, I will want them to find a definition of the word. What I tend to use are elementary or middle school dictionaries. Uh, there are a lot of good dictionaries that are great for, um, for English language learners, uh, but like a middle school or elementary dictionary tends to be um, more readily available and they're easier to get a hold of. Um, the reason for that is um, as you get into that uh, level four, five, and six um, vocabulary acquisition, um, the vocabulary tends to get um, more nuanced. And so you can get uh, two or three words from English that will translate into one word in, the, in their language or uh, the other way around where you know, they'll have uh, multiple words for one word. Um, I think one of the, uh, the best examples of this uh, is in, um, uh, in Slovak uh, from the language used in Slovakia, there are like seven or eight different words for snow. And so, um, you know, we have snow and then we may have like wet snow, heavy snow, powdery snow, but it's just snow. Uh, but in their language, they have multiple different words for snow. And so a translation isn't going to get you to exactly what you're wanting. So as you are looking at those uh, level um, four, five, and six students, uh, avoid translators at all costs. Um, yep, I don't like them. OK. Uh the uh, next one, I think, again, this is another uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, question that comes up a lot when working with English language uh, learners is how and when do you correct mistakes during the dialogue or a conversation? Um, okay, so I'm going to talk specifically about uh, uh, dialogues and role plays first. And then I will, I can talk a little bit about just in general. 
Um, but in this situation, uh, whenever they are writing or practicing uh, kind of at their table or in their breakout room, I will help them then uh, make corrections and, uh, and adjustments uh, as I go around and they help and they ask for help or such, or I hear something uh, during the practice. But once they are kind of presenting to everyone, I don't make corrections during uh, that presentation. I will write them all down and make corrections at the end. Uh, and then I will I'll usually frame them as suggestions, not necessarily corrections. Um, I don't want to interrupt their flow. Uh, the, the key there in, in the conversation, the skill that I'm looking for, the skill that I'm wanting to see them practicing is that, uh, that flow of conversation. And so me jumping in and correcting a pronunciation uh, or correcting a word order is going to mess up their flow. And that's the opposite of what I'm trying to do at that point. Um, now, in general, I follow that same rule uh, when uh, I am uh, correcting uh, anything. Uh, if the student is on a roll, I just will make a note of it and I will not make that uh, I won't make a correction until there's a natural break. Um, unless the, um, there is uh, something that, they, that has been said that is, um, that is either very, very confusing because uh, of the mistake that was made, it, may, it, it, uh, it makes it you know, where I can't understand what, what they're trying to ask me or tell me, um, or if they've created uh, if they've said a word that that is uh, mispronounced, but they're mispronouncing one word and creating a new word that uh, could potentially be offensive. Um, and so in that case, um, I might step in there and, and make that correction right away. Um, but mostly, if it's one of those that's like, oh, okay, I, it can hold, then I will hold it until there's a break in the conversation. Okay, good, good. Um, so the next question is uh, from Tara. Uh, so could you go over the same dialogue three times in all three versions in a row, or is that overkill? So I think the, the I think kind of the general question is, how often do you do a dialogue before it becomes repetitive and overkill? Um. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, that's going to, uh, to depend on um, kind of the student makeup of how um, how the group is going to work. Sometimes you can uh, run them a few times and everything's groovy. Sometimes you do it, you know, twice and everybody's like, okay, let's move on. Um, but beyond that, I would recommend doing them, uh, having them practice with their partners several times and then in front of the group uh, once or twice. Um, and then everybody in the class, if everybody in the class is using the same dialogue, then they get to hear it several times, but, but that can be okay. Um, but one of the things that I do like to do is after we've, uh, everybody in the class has done uh, a dialogue exactly the way it's written, then I'm like, okay, how about uh, you guys take the same dialogue and change it up a bit. How would you, um, uh, how, how could you make it different? Or have them, uh, everybody run it uh, one way as these are the A's and these are the B's and then run it a second time where they swap roles and they play the other side. Uh, so that would give them some opportunities to play both sides, um, but then they can also um, go in uh, and, and make changes uh, or uh, kind of rewrite how they do things. Great, great. I think just a, uh, I think one thing to kind of add to that and think about that in, in terms of that uh, repetition, you were talking about students practicing the dialogue over and over and then having them do it in class uh, uh, maybe once. Um, and if you have a class and you're trying to kind of make sure everybody gets an opportunity to do that dialogue in, in front of the class. One of the things to keep in mind is having your students, if you know there are students that are going to have difficulty with that, having them go towards the end so they get the additional practice of hearing 
multiple other students go through that and that repetition can really help build up their their confidence definitely um great question from maria how many dialogues or conversations should we incorporate per class um well that one's going to depend on what the focus of your lesson is and how long your lessons are um so it's something that i don't know that i would do three or four dialogues in every single class. I think uh, that would kind of feel like overkill. Um, I think it would be just something that um, uh, it's going to depend on, you know, how many people are in your class, how much, and also how much, you know, if you've got a group that really enjoys it, you're probably going to be doing these a lot more. Um, if you've got uh, some that are a little more reluctant, yeah, you may not. Um, but what I would, I would think is on a day when I am really wanting to, uh, to practice dialogues, uh, I might give them, um, a couple, two, maybe three different, um, dialogues to practice. Uh, or what I, what I'd more likely do is I would give, um, one, maybe two dialogues and then kind of open it further into uh, into then uh, move it into more of a role play so they get one time uh where all the words are in front of them and then another time or two where the words are not and where they have to create them themselves uh, or i would do uh, one that i've written all of the the dialogue and then another where um, they get senate starters uh, and and they have to write the words and then another uh, where it's a role play. So something like that. So uh, I wouldn't probably do just three straightforward role plays that I have given them all of the words. Uh, I would uh, do, I would mix it up some. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds right. A um, uh, question from uh, Daniel. Um, any advice for, so we talked about how to do this online. Any advice for hybrid classes where you have some people who are in person and some people who are online? Um, well, <laughs> we're just in a world where all kinds of classes exist, I think. Um, so I, if you have some students who uh, are comfortable working with a partner who is online, um, then you could match them up, uh, match up the online people together, and then ha uh, have them be able to um, to work in their breakout rooms and some of the people and the people who are in person um, working on uh, with in person. Um, yeah, that's that would just be uh, a bit of shuffling to make sure that everybody gets to uh, to practice. Uh, but you know, even with the um, you know in that hybrid model uh, and you've got everybody up, the online students are all up on a screen together, uh, they'd still be able to, um, uh, to practice with each other. Um, it would depend on how the, uh, what kind of camera work that you have being able to show into the class, if they were, they are able to see uh, all of the class participation uh, of what's going on uh, with the people in the room um that's probably more of a technology question than anything else yeah one of the things i was thinking about Stephen, as you were answering that you know just in some of the dialogues you were talking about uh kind of having the online people pair up in the breakout rooms i mean and that kind of works just like if you had everybody in person you would pair mm -hmm. people up and send right. them off to different parts of the uh classroom to work but i'm i'm thinking about that um activity where you talked about where you had kind of two teams and people were kind of cycling in and out of the conversation they could tag out one of your teams could be the online group and one of your teams could be the in-person group and i think that would be reliant on can the online folks see the people in person but right. that would be kind of an interesting way i think to to divide those folks up so the online folks can uh help each other. They can talk to each mm -hmm. other and give each other ideas either in the chat or uh, right. talking and the same can happen in the um, in the in-person group. So that's right. an activity that I think would adjust really well for, for that environment. Right. 
Um, Lauren asks, how do you recommend using language experience approach in dialogue practice for beginning to intermediate learners with low literacy in their la native language? Um, hmm. So I would, ooh, that was a trickier one. Um, I think that I would, I, I would just really spend the time um, can really looking at, you know, kind of real world scenarios and, um, and using their personal, using those experience stories um, to kind of build that uh, a role play or, or build the dialogue. Um, because you're working with, you know, any kind of dialogue situation is, a, is gonna be a bit harder with people who don't have a lot of literacy in their first language. Um, and so it's gonna be one of those that you're gonna spend a lot more time uh, kind of helping them uh, understand the vocabulary and understand the words and the, and the word order and such. Um, but, you know, when they don't have a lot of the, that literacy, um, using the dialogues is harder because uh, they don't have the literacy, if they don't have the literacy yet in English and they don't have um, much literacy in their first language, um, I would, it's, it's going to be much more challenging. Uh, this may be a skill that you're going to want to hold off on uh, until they do have enough um, literacy that they can they can read the dialogue, um, but even whenever you're working at that very ba uh, basic level, um, most of the time we have started uh, teaching them um, to recognize "Hi, how are you? My name is Stephen." Uh, that type of thing, uh, and so the, you can use this as an opportunity uh, to kind of reinforce that uh, those those foundation level words that they're picking up. Uh, but yes, this is um, much, much more difficult uh, when you're working with students who, uh, who don't have literacy um, at, at any level yet. Yeah, I would think that if you're already using language experience with a student, then depending upon the story, some stories might lend themselves to a branching off of a conversation uh, from within the story. For example, if the student is telling you a story, a language experience story about an interaction with their child's teacher or a trip to the zoo or you know, whatever that thing is, um, you're going to know that at some point during that story, they interacted and had a conversation with another person. So if you wanted to practice that dialogue, you could come back to that. And because it's a dialogue that probably already happened, you can get them to tell you about it. And you as the teacher can start to construct that dialogue based on what they're telling you and then kind of use your traditional language experience approaches for reading that dialogue and starting to learn the vocabulary kind of around that. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of along the same uh, lines would be, how do you adapt these techniques with um, illiterate students in a one-on-one -on -one class? So like very low literacy level right. students in one-on-one -on -one classes. Yeah. Um, yeah. If they, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a big challenge for you to, uh, to do these with, um, with students who are pre-literate uh, if they, they don't have that literacy in uh, if they don't have those skills yet, uh, you know, this is something that I have always done uh, with students who are at a certain level. So it is harder to adapt this uh, this technique because so much of it is, uh, particularly with the um, uh, with the the dialogues themselves, because it's all written out. If they don't have those literacy skills yet, now um, if they are you know, if they have some level of speaking skills, um, but just don't have the literacy yet, um, you can uh, use this in a completely oral uh, situation where uh, you, you know, you're, you tell your level, uh, your, your A sides, uh, what they're going to have to talk about, and the B sides, what they're going to be talking about. And um, so they don't have 
They don't have to read anything. They can get it all orally. Uh, but, uh, and that works in the role play situation. Um, uh, and it's, you know, obviously it's something you'll be doing with students who uh, in that simulation uh, type environment. Uh, but on, as far as a dialogue is concerned, if they don't have the, the literacy, um, it's not a technique I would, I would jump in with. Great, great. And because we're getting kind of close to the top of the hour, I'm going to take a minute and do some uh, additional housekeeping and then we'll uh, come back to the remainder of the questions. So um, first of all, let me share my screen. And um, also to remind people that if you do have questions, uh, please get those in by the top of the hour so that we can get those answered on the recording. And we know some of you will need to leave at the top of the hour. That's fine. If you want to stick around and listen to Stephen's answers to the remaining questions, you're welcome to do that. But we will cut the questions off at the top of the hour because we all need to go back and do the rest of our work at some point during the day. Um, again, just to remind you about the coaching sessions uh, coming up. Uh, for this session, we've got some beginning on uh, Friday, April 14th, and running through Friday, April 28th. And this slide will be in the slide deck that gets sent out to um, in the follow-up email. You'll also get an email uh, with links to sign up for the coaching sessions. And again, if you haven't had a, uh, if you haven't taken advantage of those, uh, we've got some really great questions here. This would be an opportunity to kind of uh, go and meet with Stephen and some others and uh, kind of ask those questions related to your specific uh, circumstances. Um, also, we've got uh, kind of three remaining webinars left, uh, one around um, high school equivalency, one working with uh, basic level uh, literacy learners and one around using published materials in a multi-level group or class. Also, to let you know if you've missed out on some of our previous webinars, uh, you can go to our website, proliteracy.org slash professional development slash teacher training plus, click on the topic that you're interested in and you can find the recordings of the previous webinars that we've done. And the last thing to let you guys know is that we will have funding to do these uh, webinar sessions again uh, um, next fiscal year. So again, we'll start up in probably uh, September with the first round of webinars again in kind of January and then again in late March, early April. So we're really excited that we're gonna be able uh, to continue this. We're going to add some additional topics um, and we're going to send out a survey to everybody that's registered for one of the webinars, probably around mid-May. It's going to be a short survey, just asking you um, to kind of rate the webinars, rate the coaching sessions. But the important thing is there will be a place that asks you uh, what additional topics you would like for us to uh, address. So this will help us kind of uh, lay out our uh, topics for the upcoming year and give you an opportunity to have some say in that. So that's all I have for the uh, kind of housekeeping pieces. I'll stop sharing and we'll get back to Stephen answering questions. Um, so Stephen, we um, uh, have another question. You've kind of talked about this a little bit. Uh, what about when you only have one student? Um, so you've talked about some of the uh, uh, kind of um, techniques and, and how they adapt to having one student. One kind of nuance or addition to that question I would ask, one of the reasons that we do dialogues is to give students practice in hearing other people speak. Um, and so that becomes a struggle when it's just you and a student, you know, a singular student as well. So uh, any thoughts about that as well as kind of particular strategies that work better with one-on-one -on -one students? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, for the most part, every one of your lessons are going to be, are going to kind of feel like this is something we're already doing uh, because, you know, my student 
and I talk all the time. They talk half the time. Um, that by design, that's how it works. Um, but you can still use this technique, particularly whenever you're um, introducing new vocabulary or you're really wanting to focus on this particular type of sentence structure or you notice that your student is making a very com uh they're making a mistake repeatedly and so because they're always making that mistake write out the dialogue in a way that they have to use it correctly and so um so whenever they're hearing themselves use it correctly um they're maybe uh, as they're reading it and you know, practicing it, uh, they would be using that the correct sentence structure, uh, the correct vocabulary. Um, it would give them that reinforcement of this is how it's supposed to sound, and this is how my it sounds coming out of my own mouth. And so, uh, absolutely using this with with a one on one um, as a way to practice new vocabulary or very very targeted sentence structure. Uh, could be a very useful tool. Great. And um, I think that's a, actually a good transition to the next question from Barbara, who says, my student has difficulty with using object pronouns versus subjective pronouns. Uh, the student says, him go. If we're doing a simulation, uh, do I correct her during the simu simulation or wait until we're done? So I think the example that you just gave about writing it out you know, when you know your students having a trouble with a, a particular structure and writing it out so that they have that structure corrected is one example. But then again, this kind of also goes back to the correction piece. Right. Okay. So what I, if this was a one-on-one -on -one situation um, and I spent a lot of time working with that student on those pronouns, um, what I would do is I would develop a, um, a, a nonverbal cue to let them know that they have made that mistake again. Um, and so um, something like an eyebrow raise or a hand gesture or something that would tell your student, this is the mistake that you've made and um, we're uh, and you've done it, you know, this is one we practice and this is one you know. And so whenever they see me do that, whatever that nonverbal cue is, um, then they would know that they need to jump back and correct that one. Um, just because if it's a mistake that they're using, that they're uh, doing frequently, uh, that's something that I would, um, uh, that I would develop and not just in this situation I would develop, I, I would use that same gesture uh, every time they're, they're speaking. Yeah. This next question, I'm kind of smiling because it's a question that I asked um, when we were going over the content and, and practicing for the webinar. So this is from Joseph. Does it work well at times if one uses a dialogue and simulation at the same time? For example, a play within a play. And I remember asking you this same exact question when we were going over the content. Um, Take it away, Stephen. <laughs> and 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 I, I'm gonna you know, probably say very similar uh, to what I said before. Uh, in in all the <clears throat> in all of these things, uh, sometimes, yes, it's gonna work, sometimes uh, not as much. Uh, where you have a situation where some of the words are mapped out completely and some are not as not as mapped out um, and or they have the opening and the, the conclusion are um, are very structured written out dialogues and then the chunk in the middle is a role play uh, and they can kind of go off on their own um, basically what I would I would think about there is what is the um, what's the skill you're wanting them to develop, and so letting them go off script in the middle and explore uh, wherever they want to is fine, and then having them kind of loop back in to uh, the very specific dialogue uh, to conclude the conversation uh, could be a, a good technique. I like it. I like it. Um, a question from. I think Maha, M-A-J-A, 
Uh, how could you adjust this for a mixed level class? That's a great question. Um, well, you could do the, um, the technique that the last guy just asked about, uh, where those who are uh, a little bit lower, they stick to the script and they do exactly what's on the paper. And those who are a little higher get to kind of go off on their own uh, in the middle and the, or they get to add things at the end or uh, get to rearrange. Um, you could also pair a higher and lower student together and have uh, use one of the techniques that uses just sentence starters. And so they can work together to uh, to complete the dialogue and then it's all written out and they can uh, they can practice it together uh, and then present together. But in the um, in the, the part where um, they are developing the, the, the dialogue, uh, they have the lower level person as a higher level person they can depend on. Uh, but there's a lot of ways that you can uh, can make this work in a, in a multi-level classroom. Uh, just kind of uh, let the student's imagination take it. Uh, the higher level students who have that ability, uh, let them see where they go with it. Um, here's a question from uh, Donna. Dialogues require being able to read English. How do I determine if my students can read English? Um, there are lots of assessments out there that you can do with your student. And I'm assuming that by the time they have, uh, that you know, you're jumping to a, a, a dialogue with your student, you've been with them long enough that you know which ones have some level of literacy or not. Uh, but your textbook series will have uh, diagnostics in them. Um, and if you're working through a center, uh, your student, your um, your center will have some sort of assessments that they do uh, with with the students that they are likely to do uh, have done before they get to you. Uh, but yes, I would definitely uh, make sure that you've done some sort of reading assessment with them uh, before you uh, before you jump into a dialogue with this. Yeah, I would also say, Stephen. I know I've seen teachers who teach dialogues without writing the dialogues down as well. So if they're working on just say a simple dialogue, like introducing yourself to your neighbor or something like that, they will just model the dialogue without having it written down. So the students are focused on listening to the dialogue and the words. And um, if it's a group, everybody might repeat it over and over again, just as a group, both parts until they kind of understand um, all the different uh, pieces of the conversation or pieces of the dialogue, and then work into students taking over one role or another. And so that's a way, I mean, I think a lot of times we think about having a dialogue written out and then having the students read it. But the dialogue itself is really, I mean, when we're conversing with other people, we don't have what we're gonna say written out. So that's really, it's really an oral skill. Right. Uh, in those role plays, you could talk about, uh, you could tell person A, this is the type of thing that you're going to be talking about. And person B, this is the type of thing you're going to be talking about. Uh, and just let the conversation happen. So, uh, yeah, jumping it more into the, the role play world, uh, yeah. as opposed to the dialogue world. Dialogues, kind of by definition, are written out. And, and so, uh, moving it along uh, into the role play world uh, where they have verbal instructions. Uh, mm -hmm. um, here's a great question from Kelsey. Um, how do you help uh, a, a student transition the mind from thinking in their native language into the language that they're learning? Which I think th that ability to kind of think in English for a non-native English speaker is a really an important aspect of having natural conversations with other native English speakers. It's funny. Uh, one of the things that I find um, that gets someone um, thinking in, uh, in English as opposed to the native language is frequent conversation. Um, because conversation tends to happen fast. 
And so they don't tend to have as much time in a conversation to jump into a translation, think about their response and jump back. And so um, what ends up happening is the more they practice their conversation skills, the more they are, they find themselves thinking in English. And so um, developing that, uh, that skill of, or spending time developing that skill of improving their conversation skills uh, is going to help move them that direction. Yeah, and that's not just on dialogues, but that's incorporating just discussion everything. in your classroom, that's incorporating warm-up activities where people talk about uh, topics or whatever they did that weekend, um, but having those natural conversations. I think that's great. Uh, Melinda asks, do you incorporate uh, simple grammar skills in with these uh, dialogue techniques? The nice thing about these dialogues is you can build them around whatever skill you're wanting to, to work on. Um, if you're looking for uh, a specific way that you, uh, if you're working on um, uh, past tense verbs and uh, you can build the entire dialogue, making sure that, they, that it, it really does incorporate past tense. Or if you're looking at the difference between uh, past, uh, past simple and present perfect, um, build your dialogue with those two verbs bouncing in and out so you can get them hearing the difference of when you use which one. Um, so the nice thing, the, I, one of the great things about this technique is you can build them uh, based on whatever skill it is that you're wanting your student to practice. So if it is on pronunciation, if it is on certain vocabulary, if it's on certain sentence structure or on uh, certain grammar techniques, um, you can build those sentences around that specific thing. Great. And we got a couple more questions. And before we get to those, um, I wanted to go because um, I think it was uh, Melinda had a question earlier, what is a Jamboard? Because we were talking about a Jamboard okay. and Danielle had uh, typed in an answer that it's a online whiteboard, a collaborative whiteboard uh, through Google. But we actually had a webinar a year or two ago about using Jamboards in instruction. And I'm just gonna post a link to that webinar in the chat because I think it's, uh, was a really good webinar on all the different ways that you can uh, use Jamboard. So that's just a little plug and now it'll be in the chat transcript when we get that. And it's um, also in my published materials one. And, and it's also in your published materials. Um, question from Connie, and I'm gonna have a response to it uh, before you respond. Can you offer additional resources for dialogue building? Connie, I'm gonna encourage you to come to a coaching session uh, where um, Stephen might be able to do that and actually share some resources that are specifically relevant to your particular uh, teaching environment. But Stephen, go ahead. Actually, um, whenever you get the follow-up sheet for this presentation, um, there are four or five resources that I have um, put on there uh, with the links that uh, you'll just be able to click on those. Uh, and, and see the resources I used. Great. And our last question, I think this is a great one from Kelsey. What advice do you have for learners that do not have a lot of opportunity to practice their English skills? Um, so what I do um, is I will assign homework. Uh, that's things like um, go to the grocery store and ask somebody where the cornflakes. Um, something that they already know the answer to, so it's not that important, um, but it's an opportunity to practice with somebody new, uh, going to Target and you know, finding a shirt and asking somebody, does this come in a large? Do you have this in blue? Uh, asking somebody, you know, getting out of their comfort zone and, and talking to somebody who um, they, aren't normally interacting with, but it's in a situation where they are already uh, something they're likely to be doing anyway. Um, make them go into uh, Starbucks and order a coffee instead of 
going through the drive through or whatever, have that where they have to go in, where they have to interact with somebody in, in more than, uh, than just doing it all on your own uh, and going through the self checkout line. Uh, so whenever you go to the, through the, the line at the grocery store, um, actually um, engaging with the person who's checking, uh, checking out your groceries. Yeah. And I would say, Stephen, if, um, if there's uh, kind of a little bit of apprehension, because there's a big jump between kind of doing it in a controlled environment in your classroom and then immediately going out and doing it on your own. But I would encourage you, if you have the opportunity to take field trips to uh, a restaurant or a grocery store, and uh, uh, so they have an opportunity to practice, but also have kind of that uh, support network of you, the instructor and other students too. Uh, help them out. So it's a good kind of transitional opportunity to practice out there in the uh, real world outside of the classroom. Absolutely. I think the a field trip to a grocery store uh, is a great uh, opportunity for you and your students. All right. And I think that, and, and in fact, Kelsey says, um, I'm taking my class to Target this week after making a shopping list last week. So Kelsey, Perfect. that's a great, uh, that's a great example. All right. I, that's all the questions we have. Uh, thank you again, Stephen, for, for this webinar, for all the webinars you've done during this uh, series, your great uh, uh, resources you've given us, uh, great insight. And again, kind of letting folks know, reminding you, you're going to get a follow-up email. It's going to have the slides. It's going to have the recording. It's also going to have, within the slides, links to sign up for those coaching sessions. So really encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, thank you for joining us um, and participating in this uh, kind of first round of the Teacher Training Plus uh, project with the webinars and the coaching sessions. It's a model that we're, we've been testing out. We think it's uh, been pretty effective. We hope you've enjoyed it and found it useful. And uh, take care and have a great rest of the day. Bye, everyone. Hope to see a lot of you in the coaching sessions. Bye-bye.